Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is secondary active transport. The reason why is because some of you all haven't discussed this in 189, so I thought I'd go ahead and uh, discuss this because this is relevant not only for the digestive system, but it's also relevant for the urinary system. So secondary active transport is basically the movement of at least two substances. So we're going to move one substance following its concentration gradient, meaning from high to low, which is classic diffusion, and at the same time, we're going to move another substance against its concentration gradient, meaning from low to high. So you can think of it as active transport. So in essence, secondary active transport is a combination of both diffusion and active transport. All right, so this is divided into two parts. We have what's called symport and antiport. Now, they involve transmembrane proteins. So if we're talking about symport, the transmembrane protein is referred to as a symporter. And if we're talking about antiport, then the transmembrane protein is referred to as an antiporter. So let's look at symport, which is one type of secondary active transport. So we're looking at two substances here, A and B. So we know that inside the cell is intracellular and outside of the cell is extracellular, right? And we'll say that we have a high concentration of A extracellularly and we have a low concentration of A intracellularly. Now what about substance B? Well, we're going to say that substance B has a low concentration extracellularly, while inside the cell, intracellularly, we have a high concentration of B. All right, so let's move A, all right? We're going to say we're going to move A following its concentration gradient. So in other words, we're going to go from outside of the cell to inside the cell. So we're moving A following its concentration gradient from high to low. Once again, this is diffusion. Now, what about B? All right, we're going to move B. This time, we're going to move it against its concentration gradient from low to high. So let's draw the arrow this way. So now we're moving B from low to high. So this is what I was saying about secondary active transport. It's a combination of diffusion and active transport built into one. Now, the reason why this is called symport is because we're moving two substances in the same direction. We're moving A inside the cell, and simultaneously we're moving B also inside the cell. Once again, this is symport, and the transmembrane protein is a symporter. Now what about antiport, which is the next half of secondary active transport? So let's say that we have a high concentration of C outside of the cell, and a low concentration of C inside, right, intracellularly. And we'll also say that we have a low concentration of substance D intracellularly, and we have a high concentration of D extracellularly. All right, so what exactly is antiport? So let's go ahead and move C, all right? So we're going to move C following its concentration gradient from high to low. Once again, classic diffusion, all right? So we're going to move it, boom. So it's going to go from an area of high to an area of low. Now, at the same time, it's going to move substance D, right? And this time, it's going to go in the opposite direction. So we're going to go from low to high. This is active transport. The only difference between symport and antiport is the direction of the movement of these two substances. So the fact that C is going from out to in and D is going from in to out, is what makes this thing antiport. And the transmembrane protein that allows this to happen is referred to as an antiporter. So please remember, when it comes to secondary active transport, we're moving two substances, or at least two substances. One substance is following its concentration gradient from high to low, and simultaneously moving another substance against its concentration gradient from low to high. Okay, so let's go ahead and apply what we've just discussed to what's happening in the small intestines, okay? And 90% of this happens in the jejunum, the major site of 
chemical digestion and reabsorption. And the jejunum, of course, is the middle segment of the small intestines. So here is your starch, right? Your polysaccharide. And here is pancreatic amylase. So amylase is going to break this into oligosaccharides and disaccharides. And um, the oligosaccharide is not illustrated in this image or this picture, but maltose is. So the disaccharide maltose is right there, right? And here are your brush border enzymes. And this brush border enzymes will do the final clipping or the final cut or will hydrolyze maltose. So in other words, since we're using maltose as this example, that brush border enzyme is maltase. All right, so maltase, brush border enzyme, clips it. And so now we have these individual glucose molecules, right? These individual monosaccharides. So before we talk about the movement of glucose, again, where glucose is the example, let's talk about where we have more concentration of these substances. So let's begin with sodium, all right? So it turns out that we have more sodium outside the cell than inside. So we have less sodium inside versus out. And this is the norm. This is what we usually see. Now, what about this monosaccharide, which glucose is being used as the example? We have the opposite. So we have a low concentration of glucose, and I'll squeeze it over here, low concentration of this glucose as the example, whereas inside the cell we have lots of it, all right? So lots of this monosaccharide. Now the reason being why we have a high concentration of monosaccharides inside the cell versus out is because of the volume, right? So the cells are tiny. So inside the cell compared to what's in the lumen is significantly different. So the fact that the cell is so tiny, the inside of that cell, we're going to have a high concentration of these monosaccharides inside relative to what we find in the lumen of our small intestines. So here is this symporter. All right, so I'm going to shade it right there. That's your symporter. So why is it called a symporter? Because we're going to move sodium from out to in following its concentration gradient, and that will allow the movement of the monosaccharide glucose, in this case, against its concentration gradient. Take note of the direction. They're moving in the same direction. In other words, they're going inside the cell. This is why this is symport. So now that we have all this monosaccharides glucose, as our example, inside the cell, it cannot remain inside the cell. The whole idea is to absorb this glucose. Now that we've introduced this into this absorptive cell, this brush border cell, what now comes next? Well, right over here. So we're now going to look at this area right there, all right? So this is your facilitated diffusion. So we have these monosaccharide carrier transmembrane protein once again, and it's facilitated diffusion. So we're moving the monosaccharide glucose following its concentration gradient from high to low. And so I hope you see that we have a low concentration of the monosaccharides in the interstitial fluid versus what's inside the cell. So almost immediately, this now monosaccharide glucose, as the example, then enters the blood vessel, all right, via those intercellular clefts. Now, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Please remember, this is a blood capillary. Okay, now what about the sodium-potassium pump? All right, now this sodium potassium pump, and I'll go ahead and highlight that right there. So that sodium potassium pump, that's your classic active transport, all right? So we're moving sodium and we're moving potassium. So this is not an antiporter. The reason why this is not an antiporter, even though we have two substances here, sodium potassium, because we're moving them both against its concentration gradient. So sodium is going from low to high while potassium is going from low to high. It's just one is leaving the cell, i.e. sodium, and one is entering the cell. But make no mistake, they're both going against their concentration gradient. So as far as this is concerned, this is a classic pump, active transport. Okay, so this time this is illustrating or showing us the uh, protein digestion and absorption. And this mimics what occurs for the absorption and chemical digestion of carbohydrates. So I'm not going to go over the entire details. So we're just sort of going to go through this rather quickly. Or So here are your proteins. Here's your pancreatic proteases that's going to hydrolyze that into tripeptides or dipeptides. We have our brush border enzymes, which in this case are proteases that does the final 
hydrolysis or the final clip or cut. So now we have these individual amino acids. So these little round structures are amino acids. And here is my SIM porter that I'm highlighting in yellow. So as sodium is coming in, following its concentration gradient, it's moving the amino acid against its concentration gradient. So lots of amino acids inside the cell. And down over here is your carrier. So facilitated diffusion once again, so from high to low. Now, please note, these amino acids, now that they're in the interstitial fluid, they will immediately enter blood capillary once again, all right? Just like the monosaccharides. And they'll squeeze right into those intercellular clefts. And we can't forget the sodium-potassium pump or the sodium-potassium ATPase pump active transport, sodium is pumped out of the cell while potassium is pumped into the cell against their concentration gradients. And this is why we need that ATP, because we need energy to do that. Okay, so what we're now going to discuss is the chemical digestion and absorption of lipids or fats. So let's say you just ate bacon, all right? So we know that bacon is loaded with fat. So here is your bacon grease, your fat globule. So one of the first things that's going to happen is once it gets into the small intestines, bile is released, right, which we discussed already. That bile or bile salts are produced by the liver. So the liver produces the bile salts or bile that is stored in the gallbladder. So then the gallbladder through peristalsis will squeeze out that bile and that eventually makes its way into the common bile duct, and then eventually into the duodenum. So this is what you're looking at here is in the duodenum, the duodenum, so to speak. So a process called emulsification happens now that we have the bile salts. And what that means is it's going to take this ginormous fat globule and break it into tiny little pieces, all right, that we're going to refer to as fat droplets. Furthermore, it'll coat these fat droplets with charge. So it basically adds chargedness to these many, many fat droplets. So what bile has done is it increases the surface area, right, by breaking it into smaller pieces. It increases the surface area, which makes it now easier for lipase to now work on that fat droplets. And also, by adding the chargedness to these fat droplets, it also makes it easier for lipase, which is extremely hydrophilic, to work on these fat droplets, which would otherwise be hydrophobic. All right, so now that we have these fat droplets coated with the bile salts, here comes lipase, right? Pancreatic lipase, part of that pancreatic juice, pancreatic digestive enzymes. So lipase will say, okay, now that I have fat droplets coated with bile salts, not only do I have now smaller pieces, it makes it easier to digest, but also it makes it chemically possible to break this thing down because now it has charge associated with it because of these bile salts. So lipase, pancreatic lipase, and I'm going to go ahead and write that in here, and I'll just put lipase, but no, that's pancreatic lipase. So it'll take that fat droplets and it'll form what are called micelles. So what we find in the micelles are the monoglycerides that we talked about and the two fatty acids, right? So now that we have the building blocks essentially of these triglycerides. So now what happens to these micelles, right? So once again, we've gone from fat droplets to micelles because of pancreatic lipase. So now these micelles will just diffuse right into the brush border cells. So right here are your brush border cells. And once it gets into the cytoplasm intracellularly, it will be converted to chylomicrons, all right? So the chylomicrons will now be exocytosed at the basal surface. So if you remember from 223, the basal surface right there. So exocytosis. So because it's exocytosed, where does the chylomicrons end up in? Well, it ends up in a lymphatic capillary called a lacteal. So please remember... Unlike monosaccharides and amino acids that end up in a blood capillary or a blood vessel, when it comes to fats, in this case chylomicrons, it will end up in a lymphatic capillary, i.e. lacteals. So I need you to remember that because we're going to pick it up when we get to the liver.
So I like this chart or this image because it shows us essentially what's going on with the carbohydrate digestion, protein, and fat. Now the nucleic acids, the DNA and RNA, will follow the same pattern or the same pathway as the carbohydrates and the proteins, even though it's not included in this image. So here is my carbs, right? And we know that the saliva or the salivary glands secretes salivary amylase. So the actual initial chemical digestion of polysaccharides, such as starch, actually happens in our mouth because of the salivary amylase. So we end up with the oligosaccharides and we have the maltose. So then we continue to swallow and eventually the salivary amylase ends up in the stomach. This stomach has an extremely low pH. We're looking at a pH of two. That's too acidic for salivary amylase. So what happens to salivary amylase? Immediately it's denatured. So end of story for salivary amylase. So therefore, eventually the oligosaccharides and the maltose will find its way into the small intestines. This is now where pancreatic amylase takes over, all right? So pancreatic amylase will continue to work on those oligosaccharides until we end up with maltose. So we know about the brush border enzyme, maltase. So maltase does the final hydrolysis, and now voila, we have monosaccharide, glucose. And then eventually it ends up in your blood capillary. All those details we've already discussed. Now what about proteins? Proteins, the initial site of chemical digestion happens in the stomach. All right? That's where we first start to break down the proteins that we intake. Now what enzyme breaks that down? Pepsin. Right? So it needs that extremely low pH, optimal pH of 2. However, it will not completely break down every single protein, all right? So it does the initial protein digestion, but it's still not complete. So then eventually, it's going to end up in the small intestines. Now, the small intestines pH is well beyond the optimal pH for pepsin. So end of story for pepsin. The pH is too high, right? So pepsin, no good. So we're going to have additional proteases, such as trypsin, and chymotrypsin that will now carry the torch, right? So now trypsin and chymotrypsin will now break these proteins into their dipeptides. And I hope you see what's going to happen. So now the brush border enzymes will finally hydrolyze that last peptide bond, and now those amino acids eventually makes its way to the blood capillary, just like the monosaccharides. All right, now again, the nucleic acids will follow the same pattern. Now, as far as nucleic acid digestion, DNA and, and RNA, because after all, the plants that we consume and the, or the meat that we consume, they have DNA just like we do, so they're going to be broken down and our body's going to absorb those nucleotides. So the nucleases is part of the pancreatic juice that, it, again, is discharged into the duodenum, the small intestines. And then, of course, we have uh, the final cut of nucleases found on those brush border or that's part of the brush border enzymes. So let's now look at fat and lipid chemical digestion and absorption. So we've already talked about the fat, the triglyceride, and we have lingual lipase, but the digestion of fat uh, is nowhere near as what happens in the mouth as what happens in the small intestine. So most of the chemical digestion of the fat, the triglyceride in this particular case, actually happens in the small intestines. All right, so we, we know about the bile salts, we know about the fat droplets, and we also know about the pancreatic lipase, since we've discussed that. So here are your monoglyceride and your two fatty acids, and the lipase repackages this into my cells, it diffuses into the brush border cell, and it's converted to chylomicrons and exocytose, and eventually ends up in the lymphatic capillary called the lacteal. Now, what about cholesterol and phospholipids and fat-soluble vitamins? What happens to them? Well, they will immediately diffuse into the brush border cells in the small intestines, and it will be converted to chylomicrons and then exocytose once again and ends up in lymphatic capillary, lacteal, as part of lymph. So this is a table that's showing us the major digestive enzymes, most of which we've already touched on. It's a good way to summarize all those enzymes that we've just went over.